I invite you to turn your Bibles to Jeremiah. It hangs out in the second part of the Old Testament. Go past Psalms, go past Proverbs, Song of Solomon, Isaiah, Jeremiah. Chapter 2, verses 13 to 19. My people have committed two sins. They have forsaken me, the spring of living water, and have dug their own cisterns, broken cisterns that cannot hold water. Is Israel a servant, a slave by birth? Why then has he become plunder? Lions have roared, they have growled at him. They have laid waste his land. His towns are burned and deserted. Also, the men of Memphis and Tapanes have cracked your skull. Have you not brought this on yourselves by forsaking the Lord your God when he led you in the way? Now, why go to Egypt to drink water from the Nile? And why go to Assyria to drink water from the Euphrates? Your wickedness will punish you. Your backsliding will rebuke you. Consider then and realize how evil and bitter it is for you when you forsake the Lord your God and have no awe of me, declares the Lord, the Lord Almighty. Many, many years ago, what seems like almost an entire lifetime, I was a college football player for Ithaca College in Ithaca, New York. And one particular game, I was an offensive lineman. Uh, I was about 280 pounds. I am not there at the moment, but I feel like I'm heading in that direction, which is a problem. Um, and in this particular game, I think we were playing against Hobart. It doesn't matter. But I was, I was blocking a particularly stout young man uh, that really enjoyed, seemed to find great glee into running into me. So play after play after play, I would sort of get myself prepared for this collision, and we were having this wonderful time just sort of crashing into each other over and over again. And then they pulled him out and they put in his backup, I guess to give him a little rest. And I may or may not have been quite paying as much attention as I should have. And as I prepared myself for the great collision, this player used his quickness and stepped around me and made the tackle in the backfield. At halftime, my beloved offensive line coach, Larry Charnecki, so he was a mountain of a man. He played football too. I have no idea how they ever found a helmet that was big enough for his head. When he, would, when he would come into meetings and he would walk down the steps in our meeting hall, the entire football team, every time his foot landed, would go boom, boom, boom. And he kind of seemed to like it. Huge man. And when, the more angry he got, the higher pitched his voice became. And I'm going to try and emulate it, but I'm not really sure that I can. So in this particular day, at halftime, he's going through plays and he's drawing things out, and then suddenly this play came into his mind and he looked at me. And he said, Hunter, how can you let that happen? How can you let that man get, beside, get by you like that? He made a tackle in the backfield. That can't happen. And the more angry he got... The, more he, the longer his rant went, the longer the rant went, the more angry he got, the higher pitched he became. And I cowered, shrinking in the corner. Of course, on Monday, as we headed back into the office, we did win that football game, by the way. We won most of them. Um, <laughs> not having all that much to do with me. Um, so that Monday, he called me into his office, and I sat down. And I was kind of expecting to get that lashing again. And he looked at me and he just said, Hunter, he said, I just need you to know that when I'm yelling at you like that, it's because I believe you can do better. And I want the best for you. And I believe how good you can be. And when I'm yelling at you like that, I'm trying to bring out your best. In essence, what he was saying was, Hunter, I love you. And I'm yelling at you because it's what's good for you. Doesn't always feel good, does it? I believe that is what's happening in our Scripture today. 
Last week, we began this series on Jeremiah. Jeremiah is the prophet that is called to speak to Israel while they are in exile. The Jerusalem and Judah have been shattered, and the people of God's, God's people, God's people are living dispersed all over the place, and they feel lost, they feel forlorn, they feel broken. And God has called Jeremiah. Now, last week was this beautiful scripture. In my mind, this beautiful scripture. I had this wonderful image in my mind of Jeremiah kneeling down to pray and hearing God's voice say to him, Jeremiah, I'm calling you to lead my nations. And Jeremiah looks up to the heavens and says, God, I, I, I'm too young and I don't talk very well. I can't certainly be the one. And in that moment, it's as if Jeremiah feels the very hand of God on his lips. He feels God's presence. And God says, I will speak through you. I will speak for you, Jeremiah. And in that moment, I think his heart was probably so full, warm, feeling God's presence. <laughs> and then God whisks him away on top of a cliff. This is all kind of happening in my mind. And they look down at all of Babylon, and the little lights of Israel are popping up. And God says, yeah, and I want you to say this. If there was a people pleaser in Jeremiah, he wanted to jump off that cliff right at that moment. Because God is about to undress Israel in an unbelievable way. Darlene read it so eloquently, but I'm going to do a little recap, and I'm actually going to go farther. So if you still have your Bibles open and you want to follow along with me, you can. This is what God says through Jeremiah. My people have committed two sins. They have forsaken me. The spring of living water reminds us of Jesus in John chapter 4, speaking of himself as being living water. He says, the lions have roared, the towns are burned and desert, deserted. You have cracked skulls. Have you not brought this on yourselves, he says. Now, why do you go to Egypt for water? Why do you go to Assyria for water? You're running all these different places for water. Your wickedness will punish you. In verse 20, long ago you broke your yoke and you tore your bonds and you said, I will not serve you, God. Verse 22, although you wash yourself with soap and use an abundance of cleansing powder, the stain of your guilt is still before me. But you say, verse 25, it's no use. I love foreign gods, and I must go after them. They say to wood, you are my father, and to stone, you gave birth to me. They've turned their backs to me, not their faces. Yet when they're in trouble, they say, come and save us, God, come and save us. Verse 28, where then are the gods that you have made for yourselves? Let them come if they can save you when you are in trouble. For you, Judah, have as many gods as you have towns. Those last verses make it incredibly clear that what God is talking about, the problem, the problem for Israel, the problem, the reason that they are put into exile, the reason that God allowed Babylon and Nebuchadnezzar to destroy Judah and Jerusalem, well, because it was because of the false gods and the idols that they had created. I found a couple of verses, or a couple of sort of quotes, helping us to understand what an idol is. Scott J. Halfman says this, Idolatry is the practice of seeking the source and provision of what we need, either physically or emotionally, in someone or something other than the one true God. It is the tragically pathetic attempt to, to squeeze life out of lifeless, lifeless forms that cannot help us meet our real needs. Wood or stone, God said through Jeremiah. 
Another quote coming out of one of my commentaries, the search for God becomes a search for whatever enhances my or our well-being, makes my land more productive, increases my wealth and my place and my status. Another quote here about the beginning. Jeremiah's use of water imagery offers another way of speaking about the exchange of one God for other gods, one ultimate claim of faith that has sustained and cared for them throughout their whole history. The God that took them through Exodus, the God has been leading them, the God who has given them living water, they're going to create cisterns full of stagnant water that does not refresh. You see, an idol is something that we perceive or believe in our minds that we can control or that we can create that will give us happiness, joy, peace, love, living water. So what God's saying is, I pour out the living water day after day. I give you all that you need. And yet you create cisterns. If anybody doesn't know what a cistern is, cistern was a big ditch to hold water. My grandfather's house had a cistern underneath it that caught the water that came from the rains, and you could use that for your gardens. It's a water catcher, but the water in the cistern grows stagnant, or it leaks out. These idols that we create for us are a lie. They become stagnant. They let us down. They are inanimate. They are not alive. They're not filled with living water. They're not God. Now, I often talk different idols. The idols that I tend to bring up when I preach about idols tends to be beauty, money, and I say success. If it's success in the classroom for our kids in school or if it's success for our athletes, it's this thing that we pursue that we put all of our heart and all our minds into. Maybe we want to first make the starting team. If I just make the starting team, then life will be so much better. And then we make the starting team. And then after that, it's like, well, now I need to be all league. And then my life will be perfect. And then once we make all league, it's like, I've got to be a Division I athlete. And we just keep pushing and we keep pushing because the idols will never fulfill us. I mean, money, I think, is one of the most prevalent idols that we can talk about. And we think about what does money do for us in and of itself. Money is nothing but what money can give us. Our retirement accounts accounts are our cisterns. I'm not suggesting we don't save money for retirement. I suggest that we think about it and pray about what money means to us. Because money can make us happy. Money can give us joy. It can, I promise you. If I had enough money to buy myself a brand new Corvette, and I could roll those windows down and drive through the countryside of Lancaster County slightly faster than what I ever should with the power at my foot, that would bring me joy in the moment. If I had the money to just go on a trip for two months, I could escape all my troubles for two months. I could escape all my pains. If you have enough money, you can get health care that other people can't get. But in the end, there's still tons of things out there that our money can't pay for. Our money ultimately can't buy us happiness. It can't make all of our pains go away. And the more we think we need, the more we start to believe more and more. Because that Corvette wouldn't be enough. The thrill and the joy of it would be great. And then I would think, well, I'll probably need a Bugatti because they're faster, right? Need a lot of money for that car. And then it's something else. And it's something else. This is what happens with idols. And there are tons of idols out there. There are as many idols as anyone could ever imagine. For the Pharisees, their idol was right living, perfect living, maybe even the law, the law becoming more important than God. For Martha, right? For Martha, her idol was hospitality, putting on that perfect face and making sure that everyone's taken care of when Jesus said that Mary sitting at his feet had made the better choice. For the disciples, their idol was to be the best, to be the best. We want to be the one that's, which one of us is going to sit next to Jesus? Which one of us is Jesus' favorite? If we can be Jesus' favorite, then we will have arrived. It would appear that Judas' idol was land. 
There are more idols than you could ever even imagine. And for many of us, the greatest idol is me. If I just work hard enough, if I just work hard enough, then I'll live up to God's expectations. If I live up to God's expectations, then I, res- then I, then I deserve the living water. When I've worked hard enough, then God will give me the living water. And that's not how it works for God. And these scriptures tell us over and over again how all of these things will lead us to pain, to sorrow, to brokenness, to exile, to depression, to anxiety, to unmet expectations, to sadness, to brokenness, because we can never, ever live up to or reach what we're really seeking. The person who has made beauty their idol works harder and harder to get their body fat count down. You can't ever stop working. You can't ever stop getting to that place where we're beautiful enough. That person whose idol is beauty, every time they look in the mirror, all they see is an ugly person standing before them, even if maybe the world has said that they're the most beautiful person on the planet. Our idols always leave us down. Israel, following these idols, brought their pain upon themselves. So, too, do we. What is the answer? What does God want? What does God want for you and for me? What did God want for Israel? A couple of different places in the Bible, I think, give us a pretty strong clue. One of them is in Exodus chapter 16. Exodus chapter 16, the Israelites have escaped from Egypt. They've crossed the Red Sea. They're now in the wilderness, and they're hungry, and they're broken. And they're like, God, there were pots of meat in Egypt. Even though we were slaves, life wasn't really all that bad. So God gives them manna. Now, I tried really hard to figure out exactly what manna was, and nobody really knows. There is some thought that it was a residue that came off of trees. There's other thought that it was something that kind of grew up out of the ground. But it was a carbohydrate that could be eaten. It was a bit like sugar, so it was not too sweet, but it kind of tasted relatively nice. This manna from heaven, and God said to the people, go out day to day and collect all that you need for that day. For just one day, just take what you need. And the day before the Sabbath, you could collect two days' worth because I don't want you to collect on the Sabbath because that's your day of rest. What did the people do? The people went out and they collected what they needed for a day, and then they thought, well, you know, there's a lot here. Maybe I should collect more just in case tomorrow it doesn't come. Just in case tomorrow God doesn't provide for me, I'm going to take care of myself. And God made certain that all of that that they collected extra was rotted covered with maggots for the next day because God wanted them to take only what they needed, trusting that God would be with them. The time of Judges, the time of Judges was after Israel has gotten into the Promised Land. They're in the Promised Land. They're living in tents. They're nomadic herders. They do not have a king. They do not have a military Many theologians would say that this was the time of the history of Israel that God was the most, this is the time that God appreciated. This is what God wanted. God wanted a people who were free to move about and had to trust Him for their safety. So when enemies came to attack them, God would rise up a judge and they would fight back. The story of Gideon is a particularly interesting story. As the enemies came, Gideon was called by God to be the judge, to stand for the people, and he reached out to other communities, and they gathered a military together. And God looked at that military, and he said, it's too many. Gideon said, what? He said, it's too many. If you go and fight with that many people, you might believe that it was actually you that did this. So he said, send home the ones that are afraid. And a group went home, and it wasn't enough. So God said more, and He sent, sent them down to the watering hole, and He said, okay, whoever, just, ha, just watch how the people drink their water. 
And some of the group knelt down and scooped it up and drank like this so they could look out above. And they were, you know, we're thinking these are the smart people. These are the ones that are looking for their enemies. And there was another group that went in and just dubbed, just shoved their face right in the water and started drinking. There were like 300 of them. And God said, okay, those are the ones, Gideon. Those are the ones. He said, 300 men? Yes. Then you will know that it is I that did the work. I, your God, did the work. That was the time that God felt that the people were living as he wanted them to live most clearly in trust. God wants our trust. Even Jesus, right? Whosoever believeth in Jesus, John 3, 16, we have this belief, we have this idea of believe, but to believe in Jesus, in my opinion, is not to just think that he exists. The demons believed he exists. Jewish historians believe he existed. To believe in Jesus was to put our trust and our faith in Jesus, that Jesus will be there for us when we need him, and that we will have what we need. In the very beginning of this relationship with, the, with God and his children, in Genesis chapter 12, verse 4, you hear me talk about it often. I think this, this is one of the most important scriptures in all the Bible because it sets the stage. God says to Abram and Sarah, I will bless you, and you will be a blessing and go out into the world. I will bless you, God says. The human condition struggles with that so much. I got to bless myself. I got to do something to take care of me. I got to take extra manna. I've got to take extra soldiers or have the biggest guns. I have to be the one uh, that stores the water in the cistern so that I can know that I'm taken care of, God. I will bless you so that you will be a blessing is what God says to us. God wants our trust. What are your idols? My challenge to you this week is to think about that, to imagine what are your idols. I've heard some say that your idol is usually the thing that you think about when there's nothing else to think about. I also think that one of the ways that we can tell what our idols are, what are the things that frustrate us? Where do we find us beating our head, you know, hitting our heads against a wall? Where do we find struggle? Where do we find challenge? For me, unquestionably, one of my idols is money. It's not, hard for me, it's not hard for me to think to myself, oh, if we just had this much money here at Nestle Mennonite Church, then we could build a gym. And if we build a gym, oh, then this would happen or that would happen, and then life would be good. Or if we just had enough money to go out and build 15 different churches in Puerto Rico and do this and do that, then everybody would know how wonderful and amazing we are, and wouldn't it be great? Money's an idol for me. But I think my biggest idol is me. If I just work hard enough, if I just preach well enough, then God will bless us. If I just parent well enough, if I just control the behaviors of my kids, they will be successful and wonderful and perfect. It's all up to me. I'm the only one that can save me. I'm the idol. What are our idols? In some ways, when we read this Scripture, we might leave ourselves feeling kind of broken and sad? What, what does he say here in the end? What, what does he, he says something to the effect, of course, now I'm not going to be able to find it. Oh, we say, it's no use. We love our idols. We must go after them. This is our human nature. But even in this Scripture, even in this complete undressing by God, there is hope. There is joy. God is coming for us. This is reminiscent of the story of Jesus' parable of the 99 sheep. If there's one that's lost, I'm coming for you. In Jeremiah, in this beatdown that God brings to us, God is coming for us. Turn back to me. This is the story of the prodigal son. This is God standing on the top of the hill as the son is coming back with open arms. 
God has not abandoned us. We may be broken. We may love our idols. But God has not abandoned us. We may forsake God. God does not forsake us. God loves us, each and every one. He loves us enough to let us have it when we're walking in the wrong direction. We are not abandoned. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, right now, for those of us that are aware of our idols, may we offer them to You. For those of us that haven't given it much thought, help us to see. Help us to understand, Lord Jesus, where we turn away from You. Help us to turn back. Lord Jesus, we praise You because You are the great act of God that promises us that we are not abandoned, we are not alone. Grant us faith. Grant us trust. Grant us strength and courage to follow. It is in the name of Jesus that we pray. Amen.